lessons we saw at Mara. Then we move on, there were the lessons when God gave the manna. Uh, the people were learning to trust in God. And six days they would go out and collect this manna off the ground and after the early morning dew and they would be eating it. But on the seventh day, or sorry, on the sixth day, they would collect twice as much. And then the seventh day they would eat that. But every other day it would stink and would turn to worms. And, and um, there's some big lessons about trusting God. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about trusting him for our daily bread. I know that um, I think I trust God all right, but then I turn the question around and I realise I fall very far short because are you like me? Are you always busy? Do you have to be busy to get things done? Or have you learnt the art of resting in God and having some times of peace and some times of quiet? So I fall up there. The third time, and we're about to look at it now, is super dangerous and it's different to the others in some certain ways. And, and uh, we're going to fly through it. God, when he tests his people, was not trying to make them trip up. He wasn't doing things to say, well, I'm going to see you slip up now and grizzle and complain. He was developing faith. He was getting them to trust in him on a daily basis. But now, I don't know whether you remembered any of the Bible reading with such a great cast of actors out here, but um, they were ready to stone Moses and they were doing something more that the Bible says, that they were actually judging God. God are you with us or not? Where are you, God? There's a sense of, God, this is your time to operate now, God, and sort of hands on the hips, so to speak. It's, God, have you got it right this time? I think you've messed up. But that sort of thought that keeps coming through because we can do the same thing. We can presume upon God, especially when things are not going right. Let's turn back to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 7. And just by way of introduction, I'm going to read verse 7 to begin with. Exodus, sorry, 17. That's all right, I'm just making sure you're awake. Exodus 17, and I'm going to start reading at verse 7. Exodus 17, verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And we'll go back to verse 1 and 2. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. So they're travelling around under his commandment and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and say, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray just for understanding as we come to this passage, for there's much more in this than uh, um, we can fathom perhaps today, but may each of us gain a new understanding. And that can only come from a work of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your work. Lord, we will think of those with particular needs. We pray for Norm Watts at this time, for his recovery. Lord, we think of others, we think of Debbie Sarah, we think of those in their midst, we know that's um, ill, those that are seeking direction, it may be in employment or health, whatever it might be, Lord, we lift up our prayers before you, you know our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful time around your word, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Moses understood in verse 2, that they were tempting the Lord or proving the Lord or trying the Lord. We could even say they were testing the Lord to see what he would do. Massa means testing and Meribah means complaining. Testing the Lord to see what he would do. Give us some water, the people kept saying. And is the Lord among us or not? But God had already proved himself through their time in Egypt and through the Red Sea and and with the provision of the manna and the turning of the water. So they're saying, are you really now with us, God? Where are you, God? And Moses was being pushed almost beyond his limits. He's despairing. They're getting 
serious. They're ready to stone him. They're ready to kill him. Have a look in verse 3 and 4. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. What a strange thing. They've already seen God supply water and make bitter water sweet. They're eating the manna every day. They've had fresh meat to eat. They've had the quails. And now they're presuming that God would still continue to work in miraculous ways. I mean, they're thirsty. And I know that we get thirsty or hungry can affect us. They've known the presence of God. The scripture says clearly that the Shekinah glory went before them when they crossed the Red Sea. In fact, then it came behind them and it, and it blocked the, uh, the Egyptians off from following. It was a pillar of cloud and a pillar of, um, I was going to say smoke, but also fire. There was fire and smoke in this cloud and it held the Egyptians back and all Israel went across through the Red Sea. They knew the presence of God. They'd seen the presence of God. They still were looking for the miraculous. They're looking for God to make it easy for them with the miraculous. We've seen that the Lord led them out and led them on this path and he's led them to a place of no water. We could perhaps say they knew about the presence of God. They've seen it. They've seen his miracles but they really had no idea of the presence of God in their hearts and trusting of God and trusting of this God that was leading them through. And God had now led them to a place of no water. So the people were now testing God to see what he would do. And this is hard for us to get our head around a little bit, but it happens in our church and in our personal lives. God has done marvellous things in the past for us and we begin to presume, well, if God has done this in the past, he's going to continue to work this way and he's going to continue to do various things. And we think, well, if God follows a pattern, then we're going to follow the pattern rather than the person of God and, and to seek out the way he's working in the present manner. God was leading them here to a camp with no water. Sometimes he leads us into dry places. Sometimes he leads us and we think, what what are we doing? How soon we can forget God as, as a person, as someone that we can know and we begin to grumble. Grumbling is actually very toxic and there's more than two reasons for it, but I'm going to give you two. Firstly, grumbling is infectious. What happens when we grumble? It's like it reinforces others. Others say, well, they're grumbling. And yeah, I can see that. I agree with them. Yeah, I reckon that's bad too. And it's infectious. We all get this spirit of grumbling and we we need to challenge others to to stop it, to, to slow down. We might say, stop, don't talk to me about that. You go and see the person yourself and and ask him about it and settle that with him. Or you could say, go and talk to God, seeing it's God has brought this into your life. You don't say something that's really blunt and say, what do you think God is trying to tell you? You, know, <laughs> you don't do it like that. You try to be a little bit more subtle, but, but that's the thought is there. Sometimes God is trying to show us something and we're grumbling. Grumbling is infectious. And when someone else grumbles, it's like an excuse for us to join them and we can just let it all rip. We can just let it all go and... And uh, we enjoy it. We've really felt like we've got it off our chest if we grumble and grumble and snort all about it. No wonder Moses was worn out in verse 4. I've said grumbling is toxic for two reasons. Firstly, it's infection. It's infectious. But secondly, it hardens our heart because grumbling for us as Christians presumes to put God to the test. It's like we're scrutinising and judging God. We're questioning his goodness. We've become the judge and God is on the dock. Grumbling puts God on trial and we're going to find him guilty. I deserve better than this. 
God has failed to give me this abundant life that he's promised. Why has God allowed this to happen in our church? Why has God done that? Oh, look, I need better than this to be able to, to cope well. When we're grumbling, we're judging God. We're thinking we know better than he does. We think that it should happen this way when God is taking it another way. Do we really want to be judging God? I don't think so. There's a beautiful praise psalm and it's talking of praise and then it just tells us the danger of grumbling and hardening your heart towards God. Let me read it. Psalm 95 from verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my work, Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And of course, Hebrews will quote that. And he talks about unbelieving and not trusting God. And so by not believing God, they never entered the promised land. That generation died out. The, the application is, may we not become grumblers. May we not harden our heart towards God. May we trust God. When we harden our hearts, we presume to think that we know better than God, that we deserve better, and we're in great danger. We're in great danger of being deceived by sin. Sin will deceive us and, and um, we can be like Pharaoh and be judged as a result of When we... Um, we see this thought coming out in the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Lord teaches us, he says, lead us not to temptation. And the word temptation there is the same word in the Greek Septuagint as trials or testing. So the word that Christ has used is from the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. And he said, lead us not into trials. So we can ask God to help us but not to test us so that we can trust God. We keep testing God when we put him on trial for not running the world the way that we would, by putting him on trial for operating different to how we would. God sent the plagues on Egypt, and it says, so that they might learn that I am the Lord. That's Exodus 7.5. That's the meaning of the plagues, that people might see that I am the Lord. Egypt failed the lesson. Well, especially Pharaoh did. I know his advisors were wanting him to, to turn. But ruin came to Egypt as a result. Now Israel is learning the same lesson. The great I am is the Lord. They must learn what Pharaoh failed to learn. Pharaoh failed to learn. He wouldn't bow down and, and submit to God. He hardened his heart. The scripture says also that God hardened it. And ultimately, he brought great ruin upon Egypt. Grumbling does that to us because it puts us against God and not accepting what God has allowed in our lives. It hardens our heart. And a hardened heart leads to ruin. When God doesn't provide the way that we would like him to, we begin to grumble, we harden our heart against God. We're to take the opportunities to trust in God. This is, this is a powerful lesson that it comes out here. Look again in verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the people, of his, the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And of course, Massa and Meribah had the idea of um, chiding and um, I sure did have it written down, I have read it. But what were they saying? Is the Lord among us or not? You better act God if you're here. God, we're getting thirsty. We want some water. We, we expect you to, to deliver. I want to make some comments now, and this is 
purely application and you can disagree with me if you like. To the younger people first, they often will look at church life and say, this is dry, there is no water. And they don't consider that it's God that encourages people with times of plenty of water and little water to put their roots down deep because God is there. But he may not be acting in the way that they would choose. They say, we want a place where God is supplying plenty of water and his blessings flow. They ask the question, is the Lord among us or not? The Lord was with Israel, but their focus was on their immediate needs, water. So they were focusing on what they needed rather than saying, yeah, the Lord is here and we will trust him through that. Now, if a, I don't wish any young person to be in a church which is spiritually dead and they will not grow in their faith. But we need to ask ourselves, Scripture says where two or three or more are gathered in the name of Christ, that there he is in their midst. So is Christ in the midst? Is the word of God being faithfully taught? Does the church value prayer? Is the church salt, bold in issues like preserving marriage roles or not giving in to the flood of rainbow propaganda? Are we salt? Is the church excited about the return of the Lord for his own in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye? And this, is, of course, is different to every, when every eye shall see him come and, and uh, there's, there's, they can see the Lord returning. Whereas there's a separate time where the Bible talks about in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're caught up to be with him. We could ask the question, does the church have a healthy balance of speakers outside of the church? that has a burden on their heart for for coming through. And the reason I say that is cults cut out all other influences. Cults say, now you're only going to listen to this narrow group of people that hold to their own viewpoints. And we're having Friends of Israel in a few weeks' time. We've got an insights conference with a man that's got a burden for a healthy church and revival. We're going to have family voice. And, of course, we know what they've been talking about with... uh, um, lifting up marriage and, and uh, talking the dangers of same-sex marriage and this gender bending, this idea of people changing their genders. We've got uh, Family Voice Reverend Saunders with us. We're going to have Carl Carmody, Pensacola team, John Mackay. We're having the, 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 he's the creation guy. So what I'm saying is they're all bringing something with them. They all bring something of variety and it shows that we're not just that narrow-minded in that aspect. The Israelite people ask the question, is the Lord amongst us or not? I'm thankful for what the Lord has been doing here in a, a number of small areas and I can be thankful for that over and air. We've had times of blessings, we've had times of waning, but the Lord has been always very gracious. For the older people, I've had a go at the younger people, the question is almost the same. Is the Lord amongst us or not? Back in the 1970s, Southern Christian Fellowship was a thriving church and from her came many, many people who were going to serve in other places. But they're not there. That church is not there today. Likewise, in the 80s and the 90s, there were many prosperous independent Baptist churches. Many of those are not there. This has happened across all the denominations This happened, we could think of the Woodcroft Christian Centre down the road here, which was once a a very large, thriving Brethren Church, but now it's, it's waned. I'm not throwing mud at any of these, nor am I trying to say the reason that they've waned or or whatever's happened. But I'm saying to the old ones, it's very easy to look back and say, Oh, they were the good old days when God was working, and I look around now and is God working? See, that's the same principle. Is God working today? Is the Lord with us or not? Many look back to a different era and they say, well, we saw the Billy Graham crusades, we saw thousands get saved and God doing the work and um, perhaps lesser known meetings but there are a Tory meetings and there's been a lot written about that, especially through Melbourne. There were a great amount of people saved and and, um, he travelled around the country. 
there has been great revivals through Australia and workings of God in Australia and in various places. And we, see, we look around today and we say, well, we don't see that happening as much. Is the Lord with us or not? You see, it's the same principle. Is he here with us today if we're in a drier time? Of course he is. Whether we're older or younger, the danger is still to say, is the Lord amongst us or not? The younger might say, well, I don't see any action. The older ones will say, yeah, well, I saw plenty of past action and we're not as different today. Hasn't the Lord promised to never leave us nor forsake us? He has. He cannot deny who he is. If you're a believer today, here, if you're a believer here today, then, you, then you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. You realise that you're a sinner. You realise that without him that you are nothing and you need him. You're in a sense, you're saying, yes, Lord, you are my all. And whatever happens, you will trust him. Job said it beautifully. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What happened to Job in his time of testing? You think we get tested. Job was dramatically tested. Maybe you're going through a fire. Maybe you're going through a flood. But if you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a dear possession of God's. You're a child of God's. You've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. You're, you're someone that is incredibly precious. He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. We don't have time to go into today to the in any depth about the, the striking of the rock and forgive my rock, I reckon it's a good rock but let's just go over just in very brief form reading from verse 5 and the Lord said unto Moses go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river take in thine hand and go behold I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massar and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Mm, isn't that interesting? Moses has taken the elders perhaps both as witnesses, perhaps as representing the people. And he's put them on one side and he's got God over here on the other side, over the rock. And Moses, he's told him to grab his rod and he says in here it's the rod that, rod, rod that smote us the river. And what he means by that is the, the river Nile and you turn it to blood, just making sure I'm holding it the right way up. And then to go and smite the rock and as he smites the rock the water flowed out why did he need to smite the rock oh we'll read on and see later on he speaks to the rock and then later on he'll also strike it when he should have why did he have to smite the rock God told him to Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians 10.4 And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. It's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ that took the punishment for all of those children that you saw there, for all of the people that deserve the punishment he would take the punishment and out of that punishment would flow rivers of living water. It's, a, it's, it's an incredibly beautiful picture that God was struck for us. The Lord Jesus Christ was struck for us and blessings flowed. Can we say the Lord is with us like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? If God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
How can we say that he is not with us after all that he has done? So I'm going to come to a close. May we trust him then in the desert in our lives as well as at the 12 wells. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for your gracious, gracious goodness. We thank you that when we've deserved judgment that you've given us mercy. We thank you for those times of dryness and hardness where we've been forced to put our roots down and, uh, and stop and think. We thank you for those times of discipline in our lives where there's been difficulties and we've re-examined our life and what we're living. And uh, So we thank you for those times of difficulties. I thank you, Lord, for these people. I ask your blessings upon them as we come to a close in a few moments. I thank you for the opportunity of sharing around a cuppa and uh, we ask your special your bless- blessings upon uh, Viv and Roger at this time and all that they're going through. We thank you for Viv's birthday. Lord, we thank you that just that you're such a gracious God. I think of those that are looking for work, for those that are doing study, and Lord, those with particular needs. Lord, we lift them up before you. Lord, I thank you. You're a good and a gracious God to us. Amen.